Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today, our message is entitled, The Day of Visitation. And today we're celebrating the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, also known as Palm Sunday. It is a day when Jesus came riding triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey. And all the people celebrated his coming and they spread their cloaks and their garments and they ran and cut palm branches and spread them out before him as he came along on the road. There was a whole lot of excitement and celebration going on that day in Jerusalem. Everything was festive and it was all joyful. The preparation of the Feast of Passover was about to start. The festivities were on their way. When everything came to a screeching halt as a throng of people came shouting and singing and praising a young man riding on a donkey. The celebration was such that it took the focus off of the Pharisees and off of their high priest and placed it square on this young man, neatly dressed in a seamless robe and wearing a prayer shawl. This is the story. Let us go to our scripture reader, which is found in Luke chapter 19, verse 28 through 44. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. See, the, the New, New King James uh, Version says, because the Lord has need of it. We could stop right there and camp out for a while because that is so peculiar for Jesus to say. The Lord has need of it. That gives it a slightly different ring when you have need of something as opposed to I need it. That pretty much changes it somewhat. And if you think about it, the Lord has need of nothing. In Psalms 51 verse 12, God said to the Israelites, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. He even went on to say that the cattle on a thousand hills was his. God has need of nothing, yet he chose. He chose to need us. He chose to need you. He chose to need me. He chose to work with us. He chose to use us in his creation, the sheep of his pastures. We are his creation. We are not his equals, but he chose to use us anyway. We are blessed to have a part in what God is doing here on the earth. We're blessed to be his partners in his work, bringing the good news of the gospel to all nations. Can you just imagine that the God of the whole universe chose to partner with little old insignificant you and little old significant me? And because of that, he has need of you. He has need of me. And we need to be there for him. Okay, verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. Again, here we have the two disciples declaring, The Lord needs it. And that is all that is said. The owners of the colt says nothing else. Nothing else after that. They were like, Job, I have spoken once, I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. There was just nothing else left to say. Now that they understood that the Lord has need of it. What else is there to say? 
Verse 35. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. The two disciples brought the colt to Jesus, took off their cloaks, and threw them over the colt, and placed Jesus on the donkey, and began to descend into the city of Jerusalem. Their hearts were beginning to fill with the merriment as more and more people joined the procession. The scene was becoming triumphant. And you know that emotion feeds off of emotions because emotions are contagious. Well, these people were feeling the excitement. The excitement was growing and growing and growing. There was something in the air that day, something that made their hearts jer um, joy joyous, that made their hearts want to sing, want to be triumphant. This could be the king of Israel. He could set us free from the tyrannical reign of the Romans. Imagine. Israel, our own sovereign nation again, with our own king. Could this be he? And their hearts were made joyous. Look at verse 37 and 38. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is really, really important. At the time that the high priest was choosing a Passover lamb, the people were choosing their Passover lamb, as it were, which was Jesus the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before there ever was a world, before there ever was a, a, an earth, before there ever was people. God had a plan for redemption, a plan to save mankind, a plan to save you and to save me, to save your family and to save my family. His own blood would be shed, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Sin is so terrible and so repulsive to God that only the shedding of innocent blood would suffice the penalty for sin. For it is written, the soul that sinneth shall die. Look, at the reaction of the Pharisees in verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out, Jesus said. When the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the God of all creation is being celebrated, nothing can keep their peace, not even the stones. Because if we keep quiet, the stones will cry out in our place. I don't know about you, but I don't want no stone to cry out in my place. I want to sing my praises to my Jesus, to my Lord, the one who died for me, the one who suffered and purchased my salvation. I want to praise him myself. Thank you very much, stones. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And now the theme of our message, starting at verse 31. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. All of this happened on the first day of the week, on a Sunday. It is the 10th day of Nisan. The high priest is selecting the Passover lamb that will be slain on the 14th day 
Passover. Now, all of this is interrupted by this triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. They were busy with the requirements of the law as it pertained to the instructions for the Passover and for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were doing all the right things. They were doing all the right things at the right time. But they did not recognize the day of their visitation. The day when God himself would visit them. That they would have the choice either to receive him or to reject him. It was like when Jesus told Martha that she was anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. And Mary had chosen that good thing, and it would not be taken away from her. It was Mary's day of visitation. And like Mary, we must be vigilant. We must watch and pray so that we will not miss the day of our visitation. We cannot get so busy, even with church stuff, that we miss the day of visitation. The day that the Lord himself shows up on our front door or show up in the time of our worship or even when he comes to answer the prayers that we have been diligently praying. He comes to answer those prayers. We must keep vigilant. For we do not the day, know the day when our Lord and our Savior will show up. If the Jews had only recognized their Messiah, and if they had only chosen Him and had accepted Him, maybe they would have remained and would not have been scattered. Maybe their temple would have remained and not been torn down. But as it is, Jesus prophesied this about them in verse 42 and 40 through 44. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. It took almost 40 years, but Jesus' prophecy came to pass in April AD 70 on the 14th of Nisan. The day that the Passover was to begin at twilight, the Roman army led by General Titus surrounded the city of Jerusalem. The Jewish zealots fought bravely and even drove the army back. They even put Titus, General Titus, in jeopardy, put his life in je jeopardy, and he narrowly escaped himself. But reorganizing, and after several attempts, the Romans came up with a new plan that would finally succeed in breaching the outer wall of Jerusalem. It was not an easy fight. It was a bloody fight. It was a vicious fight, and it lasted for five months. When the Jews came to the realization that the temple was in real danger, men, women, Children, the boys, the girls, young, old, everyone who could hold a weapon picked up arms to fight the Romans and to defend their beloved temple. The Romans set fire to the gate that led to the temple and burst through it, killing everyone in their path. Josephus tells us that 1.1 million Jewish people perished in the fighting. There are those who beg to differ. They hold to Tacitus teaching who, who, who say, who estimate the loss to be around 600,000. But if you think about it, the Romans showed up on the Jewish doorstep on the very day that they were to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Therefore, Every law abiding man and his family 
would be visiting Jerusalem to celebrate that most festive time of the year, Passover. They look forward to Passover. So doubtless to say that the place will be flooded with people who have come to celebrate Passover. The place will be thronging with, with, with Jews from all over Judea. It seems to me that it's very ironic that the same time, the same season of the year that they had rejected Jesus, their Messiah, and asked for his execution and asked that his blood, they said that let his blood rest upon our heads and upon the heads of our children, would be the same time of year that the prophecy Jesus spoke of, that same time would come to pass. The same time of the year. The prophecy Jesus said would come to pass was because they did not recognize the day of their visitation. History tells us that the Romans used huge white round stones that they hurled from their catapults, their engines. These stones were thrown into the wall in order to break through or at the least to weaken the wall. Then they would use the battering rams and, and, and they would punch a hole through the walls that the soldiers could pour into the city and decimate it. Apparently, according to Josephus, these were great, big, round, white bowlers. They were so large and so white that the Jews could both see and hear them come in. The watchman on the wall would look to see when the engine would let go the stone, when the stone was released from the catapult. And when they saw the stone and they heard it coming, they would cry out a warning. That word warning was, the stone cometh. It gave all those around enough time to take cover and to protect themselves from the damage that the stone would cause. You know, when I read that, my mind immediately went back to Psalms 118, verse 22. It says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus himself quotes this psalm a, a, a day or two after his rejection of the tri at the triumphant entry, after telling the Pharisees the parable of the wicked tenants, and they said, certainly not. Jesus said to them, Luke chapter 20, verse 17 through 18, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Now remember that Jesus had told them that if they held their peace and not praise him, the stones would cry out. Those huge white stones came roaring into Jerusalem. It could be heard by, by those who were standing around. And could it be that those stones were crying out because those people and their ancestors refused to cry out, refused to praise the Lord? I believe that Jesus was talking about literal stones. Yes, I believe that. I believe that the literal stones will cry out if they held their peace, no doubt. But could it be that he also looked forward in time and saw and heard the screaming of those huge white stones as they came thundering into Jerusalem and smashed against their walls, their protective walls, and those that went over the walls was shattered into to, to the structures that were around or close to the walls? Could it be? that the cornerstone that the builders rejected was not fighting against them. The other thing I noticed about the rejection of the cornerstone was this. The Romans broke through what was known as the third wall and entered the new city. But the wall around the temple was so heavily guarded and, uh, and so fortified that it was impenetrable, that 
they could not penetrate it. So what the Romans did was to build earthen siege ramps. But as they were building these siege ramps on up to the wall, the Jewish fighters were digging a tunnel under the wall all the way to under the siege ramp. Then they set fire and caused the whole embankment to collapse and sink into that tunnel that they were um, that they had just lit fire to and destroyed the siege work and killed many, many, many uh, of the Roman soldiers. The act demoralized the Roman army, but it energized the Jewish fighters, even though they, by now they were becoming hungry because of the siege. Starvation was beginning to run rampant in Jerusalem. Then a few days later, there was a heavy rain, and it soaked through the ground, and it caused the corner of the temple to collapse as the ground caved in to that same tunnel that gave them an earlier victory. It, the, the, the corner just, just caved in, and it broke down, and the Romans were able to enter the temple area, and thus they conquered Jerusalem. Jesus is the cornerstone that the builders rejected. Could it be that because they did not recognize the day of their visitation and had rejected their Messiah, could it be that their Messiah was now fighting against them and showing them that that cornerstone, the corner of that, that, that wall that protected the temple had given away, had broke through. It was the corner. Could it be that the cornerstone that was rejected was now fighting against those people to whom they had, had rejected him. He had given them many, many years to repent. He sent them signs and wonders done at the hands of the apostles and the other disciples, those believers like Stephen and, and, and all of those, Timothy, Paul, the great apostle, but they refused to believe. He gave them many years to repent, and yet they refused. Other things were recorded by Josephus by, and by others that foreshadowed the destruction of Jerusalem and the desolation of the temple. Apparently, during the Feast of Pentecost, in AD 66, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was made of brass and was, was, was very heavy, opened on its own accord. Even though the gate was armed with iron and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm stone floor, yet it opened. The temple watches saw it open by itself around the sixth hour of the night. That's around midnight. It took 20 men to shut it. The people saw it as a good sign, a sign that God had opened them a gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it to be that the security of their holy house was dissolved and that the gate was open not for them, but for the advantage of their enemies. So writes Josephus. The other sign was a great and certain, prodigious and incredible phenomenon that appeared, according to Josephus and several others. This was not a one-time isolated um, sighting, but many people saw this. And, and it was recorded, not by, by Josephus alone, but many others. But this is what Josephus writes, and I quote, Besides these, a few days after that feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month, Artemisius, suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers 
in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place, they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence, end of quote. Apparently, this is recorded by non-believing Roman historians as well, not just by Josephus. Their protection, the protection of their beloved city and their beloved temple was, was removed because they had not recognized the day of their visitation. Then there is the record of one Jesus, the son of Ananas who for four years before the war began, came to the feast and began to cry aloud. And this is what he said. A voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four corners, a voice against Jerusalem and the holy house, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, a voice against this whole people. He continued to cry this day a night all throughout the city. When the prominent people of that day had enough, they complained to the authorities and the authorities arrested him and beat him with several stripes. But that did not prevent him from his dire cry. He continued to cry the same cry. Since the chastening did not work, they took him to the Roman procurator where he was whipped until his bones were laid bare. But according to Josephus, according to witnesses, he did not try to defend himself, nor did he shed any tears for himself, but continued to say, woe, woe is Jerusalem. So this Roman procurator said, he must be a madman. And they set him free. So the man lamented those words until the day Jerusalem was taken by the Roman army. And he supposedly perished when one of those huge white stones hit the wall he was on. After shouting, woe, woe to the city again, and to the people, and to the holy house. And just as he added at the last, woe, woe to myself also, he apparently died. I suppose it was like Ichabod all over again. When the glory of God departed Israel, when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines in the time of Eli, Ichabod. Ezekiel prophesied destruction for Jerusalem in his prophetic call from 692 BC to 570 BC. In Ezekiel chapter 10, he sees the glory of God departing the temple. Meaning that protection was taken up from the temple. God no longer had his name in his holy house. And in 586 BC, the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. They had rejected the Lord. They had turned to the Baals. They had started to worship idols and they had rejected God, their savior. And they did not recognize the day of their visitation. This is what Jesus declared in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 through 39. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathered her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, 
You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When you do not recognize the day of your visitation, you will reject the cornerstone. When you reject the cornerstone, the cornerstone will reject you. There is coming a day when every man, every woman, and every child will have to stand before the throne of Almighty God. And the books will be opened. If your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, you will not enter into his glory. But if your name is found in the Lamb book of life, you will receive your great reward. So let me ask you, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? If it is not, it can be. It's not too late. Maybe today is the day of your visitation. All you have to do is to confess your sins. Turn from, 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 from evil. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you will be saved. Would you like to accept him now as your Lord and Savior? If you would, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus for paying that price, the price I could not pay, but you choose to pay. Thank you for offering life to me. I accept it now. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Today is the first day of your new birth. You are now a child of God. Congratulations to you. Praise the Lord. What you need to do now is to get yourself a Bible and read that Bible every single day. Get a highlighter and highlight those verses. Memorize those verses. And now join a church. Find a Bible-believing church. A church who believes in a right way and a wrong way, who do not embrace the things of the world, but believes there's a right way to live, believes in holiness and righteousness, believes in Jesus coming back soon, believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Join that church, be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever and ever. And that's what, we're, what our goal is. That's our aim. That's what we want. That's what this life is all about. To live it so that an eternity that lasts forever and ever and ever, we'll, we'll spend it with Jesus and not in torment. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to say happy Palm Sunday to all your families out there. Thank you for joining us Sunday after Sunday. We love you. The Lord loves you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.